Uh, my job is, um, you guys got some energy. I like that. I like it. Uh, my job's actually pretty simple uh, this week. I really am here to ask good questions and to invite you guys to ask good questions. And that's great for me because I really like asking questions. I really do. I think it's fun. I like random questions like uh, how many golf balls could you fit on a charter bus? Or here's a question. If mint ice cream didn't exist, would you be smart enough to invent it? How many of you guys think, yes, you would figure it out? You'd like four of you would be the ones to figure it out. I like those kinds of things. I like also like random questions like if the Disney princesses all found themselves in the Marvel Comics universe, which one would end up being the Scarlet Witch? Like if you have an answer to that question, you find me this. Did you say Ariel? <laughs> That's great. I like questions that make you think hard about problem solving. Like how much money would you charge to clean every window in Lincoln, Nebraska? Or, okay, good for you. Or, this one would take a little more thought. How would you design a spice rack for blind people? Like, figure that one out. Yeah, takes more than $27. I also, I also like, like, pers I like deep personal questions. I like to ask personal questions of people. Like, what do you want from the people closest to you? Or, <laughs> here's one for this guy. What are you hiding? Oof, oof. <laughs> or, what is most important to you? That's a good question. Now, let me back up a little bit. I know that some of you guys are like CIY move veterans. If I saw right yesterday that by, by hand raising, about half of you have been here before, but I have, about half of you have not. And so you're kind of your first time here into this thing. So um, let me kind of just pull back the curtain a little bit and talk about my role and what I'm here to do. So I'm going to be here actually with you every morning. I'm going to come out here every morning and I'm just kind of setting the table for the day. I got about 15 minutes to introduce us and to get us thinking and to kind of move us forward. And what I'm going to try to do each day is to walk you through one of Jesus' parables, to just walk you through a teaching of Jesus. Now, I'm not up here to explain. I'm not up here to try to say, here is how everything he said meant. No, like the point of the story is to draw you into the story. So really, I'm not trying to like give you all the ideas you need. What I'm trying to do is be a little bit of a middleman in between you and Jesus. Just so you know, my conviction coming in, my assumption coming in, is that Jesus is actually actively communicating with every single one of you. I think that's true. Now, we don't always know how to like see that or identify his voice in our lives, but I actually believe he's communicating with you, and my job is to just be a little bit of a conduit or a vessel so that his word can get through our time to you. So I'm going to be the best middleman I know how to be. That's my job. And I don't know if you know this about Jesus. Jesus asked a lot of questions. That's something he did on a regular basis, asked questions. And so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to do the same thing. I want to start by, uh, by rereading our text together in Matthew chapter 13. If you guys have Bibles or you, uh, if, you're, if your leaders can, you know, let you keep your phones, you can tune into the Bible app or open up the Word to Matthew chapter 13. I want to read a little bit uh, with you. If you don't have a Bible or don't really know how to find something in the Bible, I'd be happy to show you how. Just catch me later anytime. For now, though, we're going to toss it up on the screen, and you can follow along. Let me, short stories. You heard them read by Ryan earlier, but let me read them to you again. Matthew 13. One of these stories is in verse 44, and the second one is verses 45 and 46. Here's what it says. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. Jesus is the one talking, by the way. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. Next verse. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Those are some short stories. <laughs> Catch it. First one is a guy is just happens to, I don't know how he found this out, but he found out that there's a field and there's something in there that's super valuable. And so I want the treasure. Therefore, I'm going to buy the field. The field costs all my money. I don't care. I'm going to buy it. Second one is this guy's actually out looking for treasures and he finds this, this pearl and he says, man, it's so valuable. It's going to cost everything I have. I don't care. I'm going to buy it. Those are the stories. Here's the question that I think these stories invite us to ask. And it's a question I want you to ask personally. What if the kingdom of heaven is more valuable than you think? I do want to clarify some things. 
You guys are going to hear this phrase, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God, this week. And, and we'll probably a couple of times try to make sure we are thinking about the same thing. It's a bit confusing when you see kingdom of heaven because you maybe think of like heaven as a place. The kingdom of heaven is not a place called heaven. It's really a way of describing when God gets his way, when what God wants done is done. That's the kingdom of heaven, when God is properly honored as king when people are doing things the way he would want them to do things. So you can think about this in, in a number of ways. So think about this, uh, let, me, let me think about this with my children. So I got, again, two kids, Claire is 12, uh, Carson's nine, and they're very different. And let me show you one more picture of Claire. You might've missed the shirt she was wearing in our family shot, but it's my favorite shirt, I love this. This is everything you need to know about Claire. It says, introverted, but willing to discuss Jesus. That's my daughter right there, okay? Like if you made Claire the legit queen for a day, and she got her way, then there would be lots of sitting together reading books, lots of sipping chai lattes, lots of time with family, not a big crowd, not a lot of noise, probably playing a couple of games of speed with a deck of cards, just being together, spending time together. That's clear. Now, Carson, on the other hand, if he was king for a day, if he got his way, it would be chaos, okay? Like, it would be nonstop activity. We'd be playing games, every kind of game you could think of. We'd be playing Monopoly, we'd be outside playing basketball, football, baseball, soccer, anything. Thing. There'd be a lot of conversation, a lot of talking, a million miles a minute. If you meet him later this week, he will probably just start talking to you. Like that's how he rolls, okay? He is extroverted to the core and they're different. So if they were in charge, the day would look different. But the whole idea of the kingdom of heaven is when God is in charge, when God gets his way. And the stories are pretty clearly suggesting to us that the kingdom of heaven, God getting his way, is the most valuable thing imaginable. Have you ever thought about what the world would be like if you got your way? If everything you wanted happened? And if everybody listened to your every word? These stories invite you to think about that and then they suggest to you that if you got to be king or queen for a day and then God got to be king the next day and everybody did what he said, his day would be better. His day would be best. His day would be worth everything. I'm sure y'all have noticed that how much we pay for something reflects uh, the value of what we receive, like how much we think it's worth. So think about this with the streaming services that you subscribe to. Sometimes we'll like subscribe to a service because we want to watch one show and then we'll cancel it after we get the free month or whatever because we don't need it anymore. Others you subscribe to and you keep it forever. Here's a question for you. If you could only afford to subscribe to one streaming service for the rest of your life and you had to choose right now, which one would it be? I think I heard HBO Max, I think I heard a Hulu, a Netflix, and a Disney Plus. Those tend to be the ones. Yeah, it's a tough question. There are others. Yes. Yeah. Spotify. You just, I'm just going to listen to music and podcasts, man. I don't even need the shows. It's actually kind of a tricky question. Think about only one forever. Now, normally, I think I'd probably say Disney Plus because there's a lot of movies and continually putting new content. But, man, I'm going to tell you what, like, I don't know if I can live without Stranger Things 5. You know what I'm saying? So I'd probably hang on. I think I'm going to be 50 by the time the season comes out, but I'm, I'm in for it. So I just want to know. And, but if you really could, if you could only keep one of these for the rest of your life, then you're going, to, you're, going to actually, like you're going to choose whichever one gives you the most value, whichever one you think contributes the most to your life. I want you to notice the details in these stories because the details sometimes are a little bit more important than you think. There's some differences between the two stories that Jesus tells. The first one, this guy's not even looking for anything. It's, it, there's nothing in the, he's not like out looking for fields with treasures. He just kind of happens upon it. He's just going about his business and then he finds this thing that's so valuable, he wants it. The other guy in the second story is specifically on a journey trying to find very, very fine pearls that are worth a lot. And so you've got these differences. One person is not seeking this out. The other person is seeking this out. But what is the same is that they find it. And when they find it, they agree that the kingdom of heaven, that Jesus is valuable enough to give up everything. Is that true? Do you deep down really believe that? Like, where, where do we go from here? Where, where do we go with this idea? Like, I could try to prove it to you. I could try to lay out all the reasons why you should think that Jesus is more valuable than whatever else you want. Honestly, I'm not really sure it would work. Y'all don't even know me. If I'm like, no, just trust me, it's better. <laughs> you, might, you might be, like, kind and, like, keep looking at me. But in the mind, you're thinking, I don't know you. Like, why? just trust you. Why would I trust you? 
Besides, I don't even think it's my job to try to prove it to you. I really don't think that's why Jesus sent me here. Now, this is a little bit hard for me because I like to try to prove true things to people, but that's actually not what I'm here for. You've got to decide what you think, and I'm not going to try to manipulate you into an answer. I'm just going to try to pose the question and let you wrestle with it. Now, I don't mind telling you what I think. You already know, but I don't mind telling you what what I think or what, what we think. I think Jesus tells these stories because they're true. I think God's best for you is the best for you, and God's best for your friends is the best for your friends, and God's best for the world is the best for the world. I really do, really do. Like, I think nothing contributes more value to your life than letting God rule it, than finding God's design and leaning into that. One thing I will insist on, no matter how you answer the question, is that how you answer the question matters. What you think about this matters. What you hear from Jesus' story, what you want most matters. The value that you place on the kingdom of heaven is going to change everything. Because how much you want it is going to determine how much of it you get. Or maybe we should say how much of it gets you. One of my favorite ancient philosophers is a guy named Aristotle. Have you guys heard of Aristotle? You probably have in like some history class. Yeah, I'm kind of a little bit of a philosophy dork, so I like all these old guys. So there's a story about Aristotle. I've not been able to find it in the ancient writings, and so it might not actually be something that happened, but it fits his persona. So Aristotle was a Greek philosopher. He's a pretty big guy, decent height, thicker than me, and not the kind of guy you mess with. And, and a lot of times people would come up to him and they would ask him questions. And this one young guy was really kind of an arrogant punk, and he was one of those guys who kind of always had everything handed to him, pretty smart kid, and he decides that he wants to be the next great philosopher. And so he comes up to Aristotle and he says to Aristotle, I come to you, O great Aristotle, seeking knowledge and wisdom. And Aristotle looks him once and realizes he's a punk, and so he decides he's going to teach him a lesson. And so he says, okay, young man, follow me. And he leads him to this body of water. And so they walk down into this body of water. They're getting to a point where they're about, I don't know, waist almost chest high, kind of stomach high. And he puts his big hand up on the back of this kid's neck, and he says, what do you want? The kid says, I want wisdom. Aristotle grips the back of his neck and throws him under the water. Holds it down there for a good 30 seconds. Lifts it back up. Says, what do you want? Kid figures you gave the wrong answer. So he says, I want knowledge. He rips his, he grips him on, on the back of the neck again and throws him down. Holds him down there for like 40, 45 seconds. Does this a couple of times. Eventually lifts him up. And the young man says, air, I just want air. And Aristotle says, when you want wisdom as badly as you just wanted air, then you will have what you seek. When you want to know as badly as you just wanted to breathe, then you will be wise. Man, there's something in this story. When you want the kingdom of heaven, when you want Jesus more than you want anything else, you will get what you seek. But let's be honest, though. Like, that's always a good place to go from here. Let's be completely real. I promise you, I will never lie to you. I will never try to manipulate you. I will always be as honest with you as I possibly can. So let's just put it all out there. This does not seem like a great deal. Not, not always. It, it really doesn't. Like, you want me to give up everything for the kingdom of heaven. <sighs> this realm where God gets his way is worth whatever it costs, and it costs a lot. It costs everything. Like, what? Give up control of my life? Give up authority? Submit everything that I think and say and do to this invisible deity who rules, rules the world through a guy that lived a long time ago, a book that's really old, and a church that is often corrupt? You want me to live and die for a Jewish rabbi that got himself humiliatingly crucified, executed by the world superpower of his day? You want me to give up everything for him? And the whole story of Scripture and the history of the church together say yes. Give up everything, because if you give up everything, you get Jesus. <laughs> the next one pretty much asks itself, what is so valuable about Jesus? Now that is a good question. 